Hi, this is your host Sabin Bhartia and welcome to TFR Let's Talk. Today we have with us once again Julian Fisher, CEO and founder at Anynice. Uh, Cloud Foundry Foundation is going through its own transformation. Chip Childers uh, has left the foundation to explore other opportunities as the Cloud Foundry community and the project is reforming itself within the Linux Foundation. I will talk to, to you, Julian, that uh, how do you look at these changes? Did you see them coming? What does uh, Chip's you know, departure mean for not only the project, but also the, the whole community? So give me a good, good summary of how do you see these changes? A Cloud Foundry setup always has been relatively heavyweight. So you had to uh, you know, offer and throw a lot of infrastructure resources to get a Cloud Foundry up and running. Because the idea was to have a central platform technology within a large corporate, for example, so that central IT could utilize that uh, platform. And the idea to centralize the platform with a single or a few Cloud Foundry environments, you know, has tremendous economy of scale effects that I believe up to this day are very unique to Cloud Foundry. And uh, the uh, Kubernetes ecosystem has to evolve and come up with certain solutions before they can live up to the standards Cloud Foundry uh, has set to this point. However, um, not every organization that is keen to transform digitally has the power, the money, the patience, and maybe the skills to bootstrap their own uh, Cloud Foundry environments. Um, and thus, well, consultancies such as uh, Engineer Better, Stark and Wayne, and and any nines uh, have entered the stage, as well as large corporates such as IBM and SAP and, and Pivotal and all all their likes, they uh, uh, you know have been have become vivid partners of the cloud foundry ecosystem. Now over years, the, when the container movement has has gained such momentum, the question evolved. Um, how does container orchestration uh, uh, work? And it, the CF push experience um, in comparison to the creation of container images, you know, the container images seem to have, um, well, let's say conquered a lot of, uh, a lot of market uh, in the sense that it has not been a top-down but bottom-up revolution. So where Cloud Foundry has been pushed into large organizations successfully, and these environments, they still exist and they, they, will, they will run for many years to come, the uh, container movement was bottom up. There were developers who could easily download, you know, Docker, play around, and have their, and have their, uh, you know, rewards. And then Kubernetes came along, and Kubernetes, uh, you know, they they lifted that idea from having a local container into deploying distributed systems, uh, spanning across multiple servers. We are far away from the sizes Cloud Foundry environments uh, reach, but that, you know, it, it appeared to the large audience that already bought into containerization uh, so well that it, it actually uh, even disrupted uh, uh, Docker and the company behind Docker. Um, so in my belief, that is the underlying phenomenon the Cloud Foundry community responds to is the shift in, uh, or let's say that there's the container orchestration has uh, or is being dominated by Kubernetes. Now, that being said, the uh, the question is what happens to the Cloud Foundry Foundation? Now, I think um, the phase where large corporates, uh, well, such as Pivotal and SAP and IBM, invest huge amounts of money into into Cloud Foundry. Are over uh, because Cloud Foundry has stabilized to, to one extent and to other extents that they also invest into other areas nowadays. Which means that um, with, uh, with these changes, the uh, Cloud Foundry Foundation is likely uh, to undergo changes itself by having to cut costs to some degree. What does it mean for the Cloud Foundry as a foundation? How do you see it will evolve? Well, I think that with Kubernetes being the dominant technology for container orchestration, uh, the only direction that makes sense is to think what are overlapping parts and responsibilities in Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes. So for example, container scheduling, the, the idea that 
somebody needs, for example, the Diego subsystem to do container uh, scheduling um, is highly doubtful. And therefore, Cloud Foundry for Kubernetes has been proposed. And I think it was clear for a while that Cloud Foundry for Kubernetes will be the future for Cloud Foundry. Uh, in order to address, for example, that scaling issue, the economy of scaling issue that I mentioned earlier, where Cloud Foundry needed to have a lot of infrastructure resources. In order to cut that down, uh, Kubernetes can be used as this would allow for a more lightweight Cloud Foundry. More than that, it would also allow to cut down the maintenance costs on Cloud Foundry because there is an open source technology called Kubernetes that's been built for building other platforms such as Cloud Foundry, and it's therefore the ideal fit. So if it is possible to adapt Kubernetes in a way that Cloud Foundry becomes uh, you know, lean in the sense that it can reduce the complexity. Uh, I think the um, Cloud Foundry Foundation will respond in a similar way. They will also reduce their complexity because uh, the Cloud Foundry Foundation will shrink as the code base of, uh, of Cloud Foundry will. And I think that's, uh, that's perfectly fine to, to observe. Uh, as you said, you know, that the Cloud Foundry will evolve, that Cloud Foundry will respond. But with Chip's uh, kind of departure, what does the Cloud Foundry community look like? Uh, is there a leadership void there? Uh, what role, you know, players like any nice will play there who have, you know, you have a lot of users who have invested in uh, Cloud Foundry. And uh, to be honest with you, I look at Cloud Foundry or any other technologies, you know, we used to talk about, hey, Unix is gone, but you know, we all know people still use Unix, people still use mainframe. So these technologies will remain for a while. They will, of course, evolve. But if I ask, you know, what is Cloud Foundry community now? What is the departure of uh, chip means? And how will, what will, the, what will the community look like? Losing Chip Childers as the CEO is, uh... It's very sad because, you know, he was such a great person and it's a pleasure to work with him. Uh, I think, the, you know, he and, and his predecessors, they have uh, helped the Cloud Foundry community to become stable enough to exist without a CEO. And I think that's fair to say. There is a, a board of people who will govern the Cloud Foundry Foundation instead, and I think uh, that introduces democracy that is long overdue in Cloud Foundry, not because of the dominance of, of Cloud Foundry Foundation CEOs, but because of the dominance of, uh, of certain uh, sponsors of the Cloud Foundry Foundation. It was very hard for smaller companies like us to contribute to Cloud Foundry at a certain stage because there was a high barrier of entry um, to, for example, establish developers. Uh, we at any nines, uh, we believe that Cloud Foundry and companies who have invested in Cloud Foundry uh, will be and, and remain relevant for years to come. And therefore, we will remain as active participants in the community and are also uh, willing to uh, take on more responsibilities in the Cloud Foundry community. If we just look at Cloud Foundry, the existing users or people who have invested resources uh, or they have built infrastructure and the whole teams around them, should they worry, should they panic? What is the message to them? Well, I don't think that panning is somehow uh, necessary. The uh, customers who have, um, who have adapted to Cloud Foundry over the years, you know, they have a certain weight. And these organizations, they won't just let uh, a technology such as Cloud Foundry go away. I don't think it is possible because where Cloud Foundry has been adopted successfully, there are thousands of applications and thousands of service instances running. Like the, the technology that Cloud Foundry provides, and as I said earlier, the economy of scale is yet to be reached by any other technology. Like there is no migration path into a Kubernetes uh, tooling that will allow a large organization, uh, a large Cloud Foundry environment to be transformed into Kubernetes, Kubernetes environment easily. And it, it won't be able uh, to achieve with uh, anything that uh, Cloud Foundry will, will deliver on top of Kubernetes in the very near future. So I believe we need to distinguish two discussions. What happens to classic Cloud Foundry environments, especially if they are of larger scales? Well, they will be continued to, me, to be maintained. We, we as a company, for example, will uh, maintain Cloud Foundry. We'll operate them. We'll help to 
keep them secure as, as good as we can uh, for, for a prolonged um, amount of time. So there's absolutely no reason to panic there. I'm also pretty sure that uh, whoever uh, you know, has sponsored CloudFound in the past, they will have the same problem. Uh, and they can just go away and move on because there are so many uh, applications and organizations relying on that technology. We are not talking about something that you can easily just you know, abandon. And I think it's not meaningful to do that. And that gives room and time to let Cloud Foundry for Kubernetes and maybe even Kubernetes itself evolve a bit so that it becomes a viable alternative. So just to give you an example, if you create large Kubernetes environments, it's very likely to have multiple Kubernetes clusters. We've mentioned that in earlier uh, conversations. So that federation of Kubernetes clusters uh, and making sense of a federation of Kubernetes clusters, that is a central point that needs to be solved before it becomes a viable alternative uh, to Cloud Foundry. And while some commercial products try to do that, I'm still waiting for anything that lives up to the standards. Uh, for example, when it comes to operational ease, once you set up yourself in Cloud Foundry, operating huge environments has been, has been you know, s such a pleasure. And I, I'm still waiting for, for anything that can live up to these standards. You have already touched upon this point, but I just want to hammer it a bit more, is that uh, what role do you see Cloud Foundry is going to play in the Kubernetes space? Because there, there have been a lot of projects you know, to, to kind of build a bridge between that. Uh, so talk about that also. Yeah, the role of Cloud Foundry. Um, Cloud Foundry is a convenience product uh, for Kubernetes. That's, that's my belief in the, for the future of Cloud Foundry. Is the, the CF push experience is um, uh, together with the idea of having a marketplace so that you basically create, if you want to say it, like a shared hosting uh, for uh, running distributed applications. You, you, as a Cloud Foundry user, you don't want to think about stateful sets or operators uh, on how to do database automation. You, you want to deploy an application that's perfector compliant and connect it to a database that you know, comes from some service broker that manages that for you. And I think that is the interface to the Cloud Foundry users that will remain relevant for Cloud Foundry. However, at the same time, Cloud Foundry will have to adapt to become more Kubernetes idiomatic. So if you look into recent um, uh, design drafts on where Cloud Foundry will go, you will see that uh, it's not only replacing, uh, let's say, uh, Diego with Kubernetes. It's also about changing the inner APIs to translate um, the responsibilities of, of subsystems into more Kubernetes native structures like like CRDs, custom resource definitions, and controllers, so that you basically have more or less an adapter that will uh, provide you the, uh, the Cloud Foundry API. So what Cloud Foundry will become is one of the ways on how you can deploy applications to Kubernetes. And if you look at Knative or Kubernetes, uh, a bare Kubernetes, or you know, uh, Kubernetes with KPAC, or you, you take a Cloud Foundry, you will have many different ways on how to deploy um, web applications to Kubernetes. And it will be, let's say, the choice of the predominant user experience that will make up the decision for Cloud Foundry. So I think that, that somehow describes it. It's, it's about the user experience. It will remain to be about the user experience in the future as well. Julian, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about not only the, 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 the transformation, the evolution of Cloud Foundry uh, community, the project, and also kind of uh, instilling some confidence within users that there is nothing to worry about. A lot of the technologies, they, they were created like decades ago, but they're still around. Cloud Foundry is one of those technologies that has a lot of investment from big players, from users, so that will also remain uh, you know, critical for a lot of years to come. And also talk about open source, how uh, you are trying to balance between the commercial interest and the, the community side of. So thanks for those insights. And as usual, I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. You're very welcome. And thanks again for having me here.